Welcome to the Impact Talks podcast. Today we have a really cool guest with us today. Uh, Inzo, introduce yourself and for which company do you work for? Hi, yes, it's great to be here. Thanks for that. Uh, my name is Inzo van Zante. I'm the Choco Evangelist of Tony's Chocolate Only, a Dutch chocolate company that's um, trying to change the cocoa industry from within to make sure that chocolate becomes 100% slavery free. So that's our mission. And my role as an evangelist is to uh, simply spread our values uh, towards uh, consumers, other businesses, to make people more aware of the issue in the cocoa industry, but also uh, to show uh, the way we want to uh, change the industry from within and also mostly to inspire other organizations uh, to uh, change their ways and hopefully also consumers to uh, change their uh, buying behavior. So that is my, my role within the company. Okay, so um, I'm super interested about specifically more, I guess first let's go into the background of the company because it's growing a lot. Um, and then I would also love to know kind of your background. But so how big are you guys and um, in how many countries are you active and how global right. are you? Right. So we're, I would say we're small and big at the same time. So because even though we became market leader in the Netherlands in chocolate in, in a very short time frame, I mean, we launched our first bars in 2005 and as a business really started picking up in the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, we do about a 70 million uh, euro uh, turnover and uh, we're available now in Holland, Belgium, Scandinavia, Finland, Germany, France, the UK and the US and some exotic places like uh, Dubai, Japan uh, and Taiwan. Um, and that that sounds big, but on the grand scheme of things, uh, if you look at the total cocoa that uh, that uh, is bought in the whole world and our part in that, I mean, we now work together with uh, about 6,600 farmers in Ghana and Ivory Coast alone. But in, in those two countries, there's more than two and a half million farms that grow cocoa. So there's a long way to go for us. We're a drop in the ocean if you look at the total industry that we want to change from within. But we're uh, working hard on that. And how do you fit into the company? What, how did you start? What's your background? How did you get recruited or did you just join it? <laughs> so I um, uh, ages ago, well, let me go back in, a, in, in, in my personal nutshell. I studied uh, economics in Groningen and there I uh, became friends uh, with uh, another guy. And after our university years, he first started working for uh, Heineken and I became a management consultant. And after about five or six years, I literally burned my gray suits and started traveling the world. Uh, and during my travels, I ran into a guy, a British guy in Belize, who was, also, who was on holiday. And he told me about a little British company called Innocent Drinks. Uh, and they are a, a company that makes uh, fruit smoothies and uh, now bought by Coke. Uh, and uh, it was very inspiring to me. It was fast moving. It was very sustainable. It was very positive and young. Uh, and I, uh, I wrote a business case together with a university friend of mine. And uh, well, long story short, we launched Innocent Drinks in the Benelux uh, and ran that together as country managers for about four years, five, almost five years. And at the end, we got this uh, entrepreneurial urge again to do different things uh, because we were growing so fast. And uh, for us, it was slightly slightly too much at the end uh, being led by the British. So uh, we decided to uh, sell our stocks and uh, go our own way again. I became an independent consultant in the field of strategy, sustainability and communication. And that friend of mine, after about two years search of, of what he wanted to do, he bought the minority share and then the majority share in a company called Tony's. Uh, so that is the chief chocolate officer, Hank Jan, <coughs> sorry, Hank Jan Beltman. And uh, from day one that he uh, took Tony took over at Tony's, uh, I became involved as an external advisor. So I uh, set up the whole uh, 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 well, uh, brand values and uh, and the HR handbook, uh, all that part. And I always used to run the the quarterly meetings as a facilitator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I knew the team inside and out, but I wasn't uh, officially on the payroll of Tony's. 
And then uh, about four or five years ago, um, Hank Young gave me a call and asked, uh, Ian's, you busy? I said, yeah. I said, you want a job? I said, no. And then we got to talk about the fact that at Tony's, we don't do any paid media. So it's always been word of mouth. Uh, and the mouth used to be, uh, well, uh, Hank Young, our former CEO, Ava, uh, uh, our, uh, our value chain uh, man, uh, Buki, uh, and sometimes the people that would do marketing at Tony's. But it became uh, almost a full-time job doing it that way. So Hank Young asked me to come on board as the uh, Shoko evangelist or the chief evangelist of Tony's to have somebody that is actually uh, well, then part-time, but now full-time involved in spreading those values of Tony's. So in a sense, my job is that uh, uh, some, some companies would call it uh, the, the spokesperson or uh, the, the Wortvoerder in Dutch, but we say that everybody at Tony's needs to be the spokesperson of Tony's. Uh, and also the job is, is slightly different because it's, it's well, literally one of the channels to also just engage other organizations and consumers. So I tend to say that we communicate on pack, which is our packaging, which is our brand uh, brand story uh, and, uh, and, the, and the visuals. Uh, it's online, so we have a social team that's constantly engaging with people online. Uh, and it's on stage, and that's my part. So there's a lot of conferences, there's a lot of podcasts, a lot of interviews that I do, which is part of being a spokesperson, but also well, broader and 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 uh, and and also uh, different in a certain sense. So that is my my job and how I got involved with uh, with Tony's. And in the in the meanwhile, a couple of years ago, I also was uh, head of people and culture. So that's what some people would call HR department at Tony's. So I've been I've been around the block within and outside of Tony's uh, for the last years. Super interesting. A lot to a lot to unpack here, but um, my interest mostly fell. Uh, well, I'll start with the culture and the HR because you said that you kind yeah. of laid out um, that. Um, one of the things that scale ups, um, I mean, myself as well, um, as big changes happen in the company, um, there's so much trouble happening in HR, especially when you make big jumps, doubling a team over a summer. That's something that happened here. Um, it's just, it was quite uh, hard to really establish something which. I always look up to people with more experience. So what did you, what were the first steps, um, especially coming, being country manager for uh, Innocent and everything, how that you, you now restarted with this new company and you were laying out the HR principles. Well, what were you exactly doing? Right, I mean, uh, honestly, the first thing we did is to realize that HR in itself might be the lamest word you can imagine because human resources to me has always sounded like the most dehumanified word you can imagine, right? As if you could turn humans into resources, as if you want to turn humans into resources like tin, copper, uh, lead, etc. So the first thing uh, we we tended to do at both Innocent Drinks but also uh, Tony's Chocolate Only is to get rid of the word. So at Tony's, we call it people and culture. And I think those are the two pillars that are so essential in that part. And it's also, it means it's a lot more forward looking, proactive kind of thing than in my experience, what human resources tends to have been uh, over the last decades. It's, it, it, for me, it sometimes feels like a very reactive part. Whilst at Tony's, it feels like it is the one team that is not uh, working in the company, but it's working on the company. Uh, so it's really forward looking. It's how to create and establish a, a company culture and maintain a company culture that makes sure that, well, in, in my opinion, culture and company culture has always been the, the, the invisible glue between the separate parts of the company, right? It's, it's, the, it's the lines that, that connect the people within the company that make sure that together you are more than the sum of the parts. Um, so it has to do for us with with making sure that there's uh, there's a, a a well let me put it like this one of our core values at the company is makes you smile so your work on a very serious subject what you may need to make sure that for the team it's the most fun experience that you can have I mean you spend more time at work than you tend to spend at home and um, in an awake state. Uh, so you better make working on that serious subject as fun as possible. So make sure that when people come to the office on Monday, 
they actually uh, come uh, to the office skipping of happiness. So it's, it tends to evolve around uh, three pillars within culture. I would say there's a there's a personal purpose that you have as a person, which I would normally tend to call meaning in English. So what is your personal meaning within that company purpose that you have? And we try to really connect those two things. There is the sense of personal growth, so that you can actually uh, and achieve and grow as a person and as a soul within the company. And it tends to evolve around personal relationships. So, for example, a very clear ritual that we have at Tony's is our lunch. I mean, at, we don't lunch with a, uh, a melted cheese behind your uh, laptop to be able to continue working. No, lunch is, a, is an institutional thing. So you, you come down, you sit at lunch with people around you. We have the most amazing lunches made by TCR, our, our, our cook uh, at Tony's, uh, to make sure that you actually relate with people, see how they're doing, see what they're doing, and what they're up to from all different teams and all different uh, places uh, within the company. So, so it tends to evolve, evolve around these rituals, the fun things, and, and sometimes for people it sounds like, uh, you know, the fun things we do are just fun things, but I disagree. If you keep connecting fun things consistently, your whole job and hopefully therefore your life becomes more fun. Uh, uh, so this is this is the rituals that we do, but it's also the symbols that you have. Those those are the visual things that you have. So everything at Tony's is utterly Tonyfied. You know, our, our our table tennis table is actually completely branded Tony's and says ping and pong on both sides. It's just the stupid fun things that we have that makes every everything well. It makes you smile, which is important, I think. And and what uh, what are the second and third pillar? So it's 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 uh, your per personal purpose. So that's your meaning. How does your meaning connect to the purpose of the company? If our purpose is first and foremost within the company. And and in in these times where sometimes there's an exceeding amount of purpose washing, uh, uh, I would say it, ours is 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 as authentic as it comes. So for us, our purpose is 100% slave-free chocolate, and that is first and foremost in everything that we do. For us, our financial success isn't an end goal. For us, financial success, I mean, don't get me wrong, we're commercial as hell, but it is a means towards a goal. The goal is crystal clear, 100% slave-free chocolate. And in everything we do, we relate to our purpose. We relate to our mission. So in our, in, in, in any question we could do, we could say, so how does that help us become closer, get closer to our mission? But well, so we also look at where did the where did the mission come from? Because uh, we were just talking about laying out the practicalities of HR, but yeah, I can imagine you know the founder didn't just come up with the idea. Oh, that's it! I want to make a chocolate slave free or something. Maybe like what's the oh, background then we, behind the mission? But then we mission? need to go back. Yeah, exactly. Then we need to go back to the day uh, to the why why we were launched. Because uh, in the early uh, uh, 2000s, there were journalists from a investigative Dutch television show uh, looking at uh, the reality behind certain uh, food marketing. It's called Keuringsdienst van Waarde, which is like an equivalent of the 60 Minutes of Food or the Food CIA. And they saw a very tiny article on page 12 of a newspaper that spoke about child slaves in Mali uh, being uh, sold for to work in the cocoa industry. And they were like, they were... Uh, flabbergasted they were like how can this not be front page news how can this not be a full page uh, uh, article so they started investigating and realized that there's a very bitter reality in the cocoa industry which has to do with uh, more than two million children alone in ghana and ivory coast working under illegal circumstances of which tens of thousands work in situations that we consider more than slavery which is ridiculous in 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 a in the industry in a in a value chain of a product that we all eat almost on a daily basis in the, in the Western society. So uh, they wanted to uh, shed much more light on this, but, but the, the cocoa industry wasn't very open and prone to speak to them. So long story short, in the end, they just simply launched their own chocolate company to change that system from within to show that it could be done. Who, who is them? Uh, who is them? Who was it? So this is, this is Keuringsdienst for Vaart, a television show with the journalist Teun van der Kerken. Oh, so the uh, television show uh, launched their own ch uh, chocolate company. Exactly, exactly. So Tony's mm -hmm. Chocolate Only is derived from the first name of Tön. Uh, the international version of Tön is Tony's. And Chocolate Only for our lonely battle in the chocolate industry. 
So he simply launched uh, his own chocolate brand to show that it could be done in a different way. And that is Tony's Chocolate Only that was launched in 2005. So you could say, some people sometimes ask us, so where did your purpose come from when you were a company? It's been the other way around. Our company was actually launched, was born out of this purpose. That was to change the industry from within. But how can you... So this is extremely um, interesting. So I don't know how, how much you were involved with that, but how are you just like that entering what i can imagine to be a very traditional market yeah i wasn't involved in that at that moment nobody was at tony's because this was launched from and in within the production company of the television show yeah um and it is and and we still see that it's uh, it's hard to change such a huge and and a traditional and slightly rusted down industry uh, from within as a small company because it's that still is the, happening like is it, it gotten is, better or is it, it is still worse? there today it is still there today unfortunately and in absolute figures it's even become worse over the last uh, two decades because there's more demand for chocolate so you could say in relative terms it's diminished but in absolute terms it has even increased so it's it means even more importantly for us to make that difference and show that it can be done in a different way and inspire other companies to follow suit um, it is still there today uh, is there's still more than 2 million children working in illegal circumstances today there's sto- still more than 30,000 children and grown-ups working in situations that we consider modern slavery which is ridiculous yeah but then okay so let's let's uh, shift back to the practicality of it so the company starts and then obviously i'm assuming it started growing because people started buying so teams now started growing so Okay, the first question that pops up in the whole thing, why not start as a charity? Why does it have to be a commercial company? And then how do you onboard people that for such a mission, but then explain, oh, no, but it is a commercial company? Uh, I don't think they are mutually exclusive, honestly. So that is that is uh, an important message, I think. So I think you can be a commercial company uh, and have a very clear purpose to change the world. We, we consider that the only way we could actually change this system is by showing the system from within that it can be done in a different way. So we are a commercial company. We have shareholders. Uh, we have uh, uh, very clear KPIs on how we want to grow, and where we want to grow to. And we need to make a financial profit because we are convinced that we can only make that impact year on year again if we are simply commercially viable. Um, so we have three very clear uh, performance indicators, and one is a has always been a 50% year-on-year growth. The second one has always been a 40% gross profit, and the third one, and that is where we slightly differ from the rest of the industry, has for us always been at least 4% net profit, where the rest of the industry uh, is always working towards 20, 25, 30% net profit. We think to divide that that financial success within your value chain, so making sure that the farmers on the beginning of that value chain actually earn a living income um, and are fairly paid, which we call a living income reference price for for the cocoa beans that they grow. That is a much more uh, equal and fair division of that value within the value chain. But so but so if everybody's striving for 20 percent profits um, and then you guys are striving for four percent, doesn't that beat the whole purpose of you? I mean, I guess then you, well, I don't know exactly how it works, but I'm assuming you're making less money. So then if another chocolate company looks at you, they think, oh, but, you know, we want 20 percent. But if we grow 50 percent year on year, isn't that the more interesting number? Isn't it in the end? Isn't it in the end uh, the absolute amount of euros that you have in your bank account as a commercial company that might be more interesting than a relative amount? Isn't it in the end not about doing business where only you profit in, in your value chain and other people are actually working in situations like modern slavery. So I think I think for me as a as a from a human perspective, it is absolutely unacceptable to be um, to be in a business where people are actually suffering on the other end of the value chain. I agree. And I think those things are much more important than financial uh, figures on your bank account statement. But so when it got started so how many years after it got started did you start joining in 
Me personally? Yeah. When you started uh, writing the plans that you said. So let me think back. Uh, I think overall that must have been about 10 years ago, I think. So that is because I got involved exter- in- into the inception of the idea. Exactly, exactly. So it's about five, six years into the into the start of Tony's when Hank Jan Beltman, as a chief chocolate officer, officer first took over minority share and then the majority share. Okay, and so you walk in, and what do you see? How big was the team? What were they struggling with? I think the first time I was in, got involved was when the team was about five five or six people i think wait so they were five years old as a company but there were only five people yeah yeah how because obviously when you look from the outside it looks so big so then you assume which is by the way what happens all the time when we run our events you see all these successes and they have all exponential growth and and somehow i don't know why when you look at uh tony's you also think oh my god this is exponential growth but yet now it's like oh five years later into the inception there were only five people um how why was it only yeah, okay five? but if you if you if you take the technical term of exponentiality you think back from today then you end up at about five people after five years so if you start with uh, half and you go to one and then to two then to four and then to eight so we were i think there in a uh, year four or five uh, at around uh, that amount of people and now we're at uh, about 160 people. So I think that line is, is more, more or less exponentiality. Yeah. So, so actually five people after five years, you would say is actually a pretty steady and healthy growth. Ah, it depends on, no, it depends on where you come from. And for us, you know, growth in a sense isn't our goal. Our goal of growth isn't just to grow. Our goal of growth is to make an impact. So for us, growth has to do with making more impact year on year. And it's been a while. I mean, in the, in the first years, we were struggling as a company. Uh, and only in the last six, seven, eight years have we grown so incredibly fast. Uh, and uh, what it was changed? Really the, the, I think the change was when Hank Young took over as a chief chocolate officer. I think really then did the whole uh, entrepreneurial side of the business much more accelerate. It was then that we realized that we really needed to grow to make that impact, to make sure that we could show the industry that it was a it was a proper viable uh, uh, business that you could run in the in the chocolate industry. But so, what were the changes that you saw happen? Because obviously, from our experience, it was very much okay. So we could start as a small kind of charity event, give back wherever possible. But then on the other side, it was very much like. Yeah, but if we don't go as big as we can, then nobody will see or hear that these changes are possible. And what I'm hearing from you is actually a very similar thought process. Like it has to go big just to prove a point. But then exactly why? Exactly. Why? I think that's the whole point. Why? And, and especially when it's so impact because in oriented. The end, it's... Because in the end, you need to show within a within an I mean, if you need to show in an old system that you can change towards the new system, uh, but still within the parameters of the old system. So we need to show the chocolate industry, which is a very competitive and commercial industry that you can you can change within their parameters, which still has to do with being commercially sound, being on shelves in the supermarkets, being visible. I mean, it's the it's our our end goal in our strategy is to inspire other companies to act themselves and to take their responsibility when it has to do with human rights, when it has to do with eradicating any form of forced child labor within your uh, value chain. And by showing that you can do that, uh, being a very sustainable company, being a uh, being one of the best employers within the Netherlands, uh, that you can also move within those parameters of the old economy. Okay, so let's uh, let's go a little bit back because obviously we can talk uh, quite long about the growth and the impact, which I truly believe will eventually happen uh, because you cannot ignore when um, when it's being done. Um, so you're mentioning things like become one of the best employers in the Netherlands, as well as um, walking in when it was five people. How do you go from walking in five people to now 160 people 
and and these clear culture well i guess shifts or you know there's a clear culture that you can see even when you walk into the supermarkets and you see every everybody's packages um how do you go mm-hmm. from five people to 160 and the best employer like what are the practicalities of it do you write right, a business right. plan do you go to the ceo <laughs> and say hey uh, yeah. Like, what are the tiny experiments that someone like me with a small team can, you know, really implement right. in their right. company? Yeah, yeah. No, I can imagine the question. The thing is, I, we always get asked, so what is the what is the magic trick, right? What is the what are the three uh, key things to your to what make you successful? And and I gotta honestly say, much of the stuff we uh, have experience has all come from the gut uh, and didn't have a clear pre-written strategy behind it. So a lot of our growth has been organic, but I would say that if you are looking for the magic wand, I think one of the th- most important things is that it's this very clear mission that we stand behind, that this purpose that we have that is such a huge driver in everything that we do. They can really use as, as an asset test for anything that we do. Second is to realize that your team is key here. So we always say for us, it's two pillars, team and impact. Yes, in the end, it's making that impact, but it's by having the most inspired and motivated uh, team that you can imagine. So that's why there's so much focus on our team. And, and often when I speak about what we do within uh, our team and what we do in our company culture, people always, well, people are sometimes challenged that by saying, yeah, but in the end, it's got to be the sales figures, right? In the end, it's the, it's, I got to make a profit. And then you see that often those entrepreneurs, the first thing they cut is the effort, whether it's financial or time towards making sure that your team is, is as good as it is. And I think that should be the other way around. So I always take this quote by uh, Richard Branson, who tends to say, I'm not happy because I'm successful. I'm successful because I'm happy. And I don't put my uh, customers first. I put my employees first because they create happy customers. And I strongly believe in that. So by keeping focus on our team, and that doesn't mean always uh, uh, throwing shitloads of money uh, against it. it. It has to do with focus. It has to do with focus on your team, on those company values that you have, on that mission that you have. So it's always first and foremost, and you see that everywhere within our team. And it's really on focus on each other. You see it in these times, these strange times that we're all working from home during the corona uh, happening around us. It's constantly this focus on the team, on each other. Is everybody okay? How are you doing? Checks, buddy checks, friendship, uh, uh, love and empathy around you. So it's, it has to do with focus. I would say one, having your purpose. So that is the impact side. Two is, is that team. And making sure that it's uh, that you're right within the details. I think everybody is so focused on making sure that everything is authentic until until the smallest detail. Yes. So I actually want to cover a little bit of the whole Corona situation because obviously with a bigger company okay. it's different. But uh, a little bit later, um, I guess my question uh, was right now. Now. So what are what I ask maybe in these type of situations, because obviously culture is very hard to explain, but have you done experiments that were really like pivoting or I can imagine when you're hiring, we have a recruitment funnel that is almost three weeks long for employees. And in there we test personalities and not specifically um, their grades or anything. So what were the experiments that you did where you thought, whoa, okay, this is really going to be pivotal? Um, or, and what do you do when, you know, somebody slips through? How do you catch the person that doesn't actually live the mission or the vision? Oh, I think those are a lot of questions in one. Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, I think, yes, onboarding, but onboarding is also such a, such a, such a strange term, but uh, that has also grown organically. I mean, in the last three years, three to four years, we've grown from, I don't know, 30 people to 160 or something. So you have to set up some kind of processes for people. And we call that, uh, in our case, the typical Tony's time. So for at least one week, you're, you get a deep dive into the background of Coco 
into how you make uh, chocolate, into how we work as a team. You have this buddy assigned to you that helps you through any technicality. Where can you find the files you need, etc., etc. How do things work within Tony's? And you drink as much coffees with as many Tonys as you can, uh, you can within a week, um, to just have an automatic deep dive into uh, into the company culture. That is that is one. But it's also by having these these four company uh, values that we have. So that has to do with uh, being entrepreneurial, being willful, being outspoken, and Tonys makes you smile. To really use those as as uh, uh, I don't know the bars measurements to see how anybody would fit anyhow within it within the recruitment process, and obviously with it I mean sometimes there's not a fit and we do this constant check every year you know is is it still a good fit for where you are within your job because it it often doesn't have to do with you being a a quote unquote. Uh, wrong fit it also has to do with the company around you evolving and changing so your job might change more quickly than than you could change or maybe you change more quickly than, than your job does so there's this check sanity check on you or your job also very often and and within the company there's people that that go sideways go up ways go everywhere um but it it has to do with this with a just a plain sanity check on there as well um, and you do that check so every that is, year or every at least at least so you have at least once a year but we have we have we used to have two moments a year that you really had this check but it's it i think it's an ongoing process between you and the people you work uh, with around you and your team anyhow okay so um just out of curiosity what do you ask them then and what happens if the person says yeah i don't really like it here my boss sucks or something like <laughs> yeah how does how do the conversations go <laughs> i think it's it's a conversation like you would have with anybody else i mean there there isn't there isn't a very huge rigid structure behind it uh you just make sure that at least twice a year you have this chat and this check up with how you're doing and we used to have a, a rating that was linked with it uh, we drop the rating and just to have a, have a sanity check on, on how are you doing. But we do have, what we do, have, for example, we work with annual goals and we work with quarterly goals for you personally. And we see whether, how you, and you set up those goals together with your manager and see how they, they actually work out uh, every quarter and every year. And I would personally advise people to have this almost on a weekly level. So what are you focused on? So that also helps you with your focus. We call those the big threes. And we see how that works out and sometimes it doesn't work out and then we see how we how anybody can help you around you to to make you reach those goals but the the, the discussions the checks that we have are just discussions literally you just have a cup of coffee with your manager uh, and and or the person that works with you and see how that's working out why, why did you drop the ratings needs... though yeah because it because it was a bit too rigid and old school we felt it just needed a a more open discussion uh we do have 360 evaluation uh, 360 uh, evaluations uh around the company as well uh we also ask input from people around you that you can use in these discussions uh and see uh, see how people can measure up to uh company values and and their own goals and how how, how it works out for them okay cool um so so pretty much a checkup twice a year maybe to exactly. make sure that everybody check up fits. Is word. yeah and um exactly. and then within the teams obviously you probably have the lunches and the talks and then things like that happen it's very interesting that you dropped the ratings so um it's very yeah interesting that it became just like a discussion which kind of shows also a little bit of a rebel spirit against the uh, traditional um yeah things which is good because that's obviously what the industry needs. Um, so again, uh, back to the start. So you walk in five people there. What were kind of the first things you were doing? No, well, that you should ask me. You should Hank Jan, uh, ask Hank Jan the question because he was the entrepreneur walking in. Uh, what I, what I did when I uh, saw the team in the beginning was work with them. To establish those, for example, those core values that we just spoke about. So um, you were the facilitator I, behind those uh, core values. 
Exactly. Well, we worked. I, I, it came and comes still from everybody within Tony's. I got to tell you. I think things like um, the core values of a company it, it never stand still, right? You need to always keep <clears throat> evaluating them and see how it works within the time frame that you're living in as a company at that moment in time too. So, okay, so then you were facilitating those processes and they came, yeah, usually those core values come from the employees or the founding team. Um, so you were pretty much in the next 10 years of that growth facilitating most of it or were you also a part of some pivotal moments that really changed the course of the company? Um, and I, both, I would say. I mean, I was there externally and then internally. And I think that the biggest pivotal moment that I would uh, name in the last uh, five or 10 years was really this realization that we're working towards becoming a global movement. I mean, five years ago, I could not imagine speaking to you today talking about actually literally becoming a global brand. And in the end, for me, it's not about Tony's becoming a global brand. It's about the thought the, the, the thought leadership that we have, the, 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 the changing the industry from within and that movement that comes behind it, that is what is changing at the moment. I see, I see that as a very pivotal moment. And um, maybe an interesting part for me, um, how do you see Tony's being, you know, based in the Netherlands? Is that something that is, because Netherlands is very small. So yeah considering and the we're not mission, even the biggest chocolate consumers yeah you know? so and considering the um, mission wouldn't you want to be in a place like i don't know san francisco or in a, yeah LA? but you can't choose where you where you're born right so this is uh, uh we were simply we were simply born in the netherlands but that is the reason why we went for example the first country we went to outside of the netherlands was and is the u.s Really? Uh, because we saw the, yeah, yeah. Be, and that is not the most logical step normally from Holland. You would tend to first go but to Belgium and Germany, Scandinavia. For us, it was the other way around. We realized that some of the biggest uh, chocolate producers had their headquarters in the U.S. Uh, and we figured if you want to be copied, you need to be noticed. And to be noticed, you better make sound in their backyard. So that's why we went to the U.S. and launched in Portland, Oregon uh, as first place outside of the Netherlands. But, uh, I mean, Oregon doesn't sound like a L.A. or a New York. Why? Ah, but Oregon is a very food conscious uh, area of the U.S. Really? And Portland is a city where there's very conscious uh, foodies. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of uh, early food movement uh, comes from Portland, Oregon. So how did the so you were part of that growth when you were going to the U.S.? What, what was happening when you first decided to scale there? We uh, launched uh, in Portland at several uh, natural chains. So these are supermarkets that are focused on uh, very, uh, well, for example, organic food, very conscious food, delis. And we launched there, same as we would do in any other country, uh, honestly, and also in Holland. It's really ground up movement. It's really a lot of uh, reaching out to consumers, reaching out to uh, uh, people that are involved in the food industry showing this telling the story at any stage you can find and grow it from ground up and that is how we launched from uh, from from portland in the us so it's literally going around with chocolate and telling the story but so you guys flew there or did you hire an agent or <laughs> yeah well you tend to you do you tend to fly to portland oregon uh, <laughs> nowadays uh, so we we have uh, uh, Peter, a, a Dutch guy who had been living in the U.S. for a long time, who uh, who was our sales guy in Portland. But then we uh, simply opened a full uh, a full organization and company and office in Portland uh, with uh, somebody responsible for marketing, somebody responsible for sales, finance, operations. So it's literally. A, 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 a skeleton of a company that we set up in any country that we launch. And then, indeed, you, you approach retailers, you approach uh, the best stores that you can find. Uh, and, but since, as I, as I said in the beginning, we have a zero paid media policy, we don't do any advertising. So it's really finding the right people, finding the right uh, newspapers, writers, journalists to uh, get in touch with and, uh, and talk to these people with, about our mission. So, so you don't pay at all for any ads, also not at all. Uh, zero paid media, but also not like Facebook ads or Google ads. No, 
Zero paid media. Doesn't that, isn't that like starting a business with kind of like a, you know, one hand tied down or something like that? Isn't that I harder? I don't know. You could, you, uh, it might be harder, but we think our story needs more than, than the 20 second span of attention that you would get in an ad or, or the five seconds that you would get in a, in a, in a newspaper uh, or a magazine. Uh, for us, it's really going directly into this longer term relationship with consumers, with organizations, and that takes a bit more time. We agree it might not be the easy path, but we felt it was the path that merits, uh, uh, that has to do with how we work with uh, with making impact. Do you know Do you know a company called Charity Water? Because um, they released yeah. that, that documentary video as a Facebook ad and it went viral. Did you see that? No, I haven't seen that, but I do know Charity. So, yeah, but so what they did is they also don't advertise that much, I think, but they have this documentary video that was like 20 or 30 minutes about the founder and why he believes in clean water and everything. But have you seen our documentary? No, I haven't actually. I saw... Ah, uh, oh, there you go. So there's a documentary that was online. Uh, and if you become a serious friend of Tony's on our website, there's a, uh, a page uh, with a whole toolbox where also you can find our documentary. So it's Tony's... Um, and it's been aired on national television in Holland. What is the website then? Tony's Choco... Uh, Tony's Chocolonely.com Okay, so the way you spell it is Tony's Choco Lonely. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no, I, I have Tony's it in front of me. It's more, it's more for the, for the listeners. Um, so it's Tony's Chocolonely.com Great. A lonely and battle then, in the chocolate So I'm industry. on the website right now. So where do I scroll for the documentary? You become serious friend. That is the most important step. Where's the serious friend? So on our friend? website, you can, uh, a serious friend is the consumers that, that, that are really spreading our mission amongst their friends and family. So those are our inner core of, uh, of brand ambassadors, I would say. So you have to click on our mission then? or Let me have a look with you together at the same time. So it's uh, our mission. No, do may in Dutch. Let me switch to uh, English. English website so I, we can do this in English. Uh, it's join in uh, and then uh, let's be serious friends. Uh, and yeah. then you uh, join us, become, become a serious friend. friend. And once you're logged in, you can find our documentary, which you can uh, see. But I would also recommend people to uh, have a screening with their friends. At the mo this moment, I would say have it from your home with your friends at the same time whilst you're munching down on a bar of chocolate. And then, uh, so as a serious friend, you can watch our documentary. But it's, it's uh, you can also, I think, find it on Google Play and other uh, pay TV sites. But if you want to watch it for free, you need to log in as a serious friend. How come it's uh, behind a, a sign-up wall? Why do people have to sign up? Why is it not like on the website? Well, this, I don't know what the reasoning behind that was. I think in the beginning it was simply because it was a documentary it was on, on pay TV. Uh, it's been aired on national television in Holland a couple of times, uh, though. But uh, So there it was visible and also after the fact. Uh, and I think left and right you might find it uh, uh, also directly. But what we want to do is really engage these people and uh, ask them to join in. And that's why we have it in our toolkit as a serious friend. Oh, okay, clear. But so you've never thought about running those type of things as document, uh, sorry, as paid ads, because I can imagine those things going viral, like. Yeah, but, but again, we have a zero zero paid media policy, so we don't do paid ads. Yeah, I guess so. No, interesting, but uh, and I guess it works because you're growing, so so you just have to be more strict about who you reach out to and how you portray yourself. This is uh, this is exactly my answer when people ask me. So, does it work? I say, well, apparently it does because <laughs> we became market leader. Yeah, true. Um, I like the focus on uh, the mission as well. It's uh, on the main website right away. So you can always choose right. for that. Um, I'm actually uh, really interested now. So I know the mission and everything. I have not gone into the background yet. But before we do, uh, I'm still interested in now. It's the 25th of March, um, 2020. So obviously, Corona has gotten pretty bad in the Netherlands. Mm. How, especially like from our perspective, it was like, uh, like from one week to another, things were changing. Now, on our side, yeah. we're mostly digital already since January. 
uh, which was a policy that we've been adapting to for the last, I think, nine months uh, and officially rolled out in January. But we are a much smaller company. So how does that right. work with like our sales up, our sales down? How is the team performing? How it, w- what is going through your minds when this happened? Right. Right. Well, it's had a it's had a huge impact um, overall. I got to tell you, and and there's people that have been stricken by it much more than we have. So so there's there's no pity necessary on our end at all. I mean, if you look at uh, sales, uh, we do see a decline. Obviously, uh, uh, there's the, the, we don't know yet because we're in such early stages how long term that decline is. Because what you see is that supermarkets are being uh, replenished after they have been completely emptied in the last uh, one and a half weeks by consumers first being replenished with the most necessary goods so uh, 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 vegetables uh, toilet paper uh, cleaning material etc uh, we did see a complete sellout on chocolate as well because i presume most people still will keep eating chocolate yeah i can imagine perhaps even more i can imagine tony's would be sold out so how are the we, we, uh, we were now but we were sold out if if i look at the supermarkets around me we saw us being completely sold out but we don't know whether that was because there were more sales or whether there was just no stocking from the back end right there was no uh, uh replenishment from the back end so we don't know that yet um we on one hand, you could assume that there's more sales because people are more at home, so would eat more chocolate at home. But we don't know yet. For example, if you look at our, uh, we have a, a big chunk in our business that has to do with travel and duty free. There is zero there at the moment. Oh. So that's, those sales have completely imploded. There's, um, uh, there's direct sales from our stores that is not existent at the moment because our stores have closed um, but the biggest sales that we have is supermarkets so we're just looking at, at what's happening over there um, there's uh, still the opportunity to uh, buy online from our web shop which is still going on so we think that overall it it will not have a huge impact on sales in that part of the sales because the majority is done three, through supermarkets But at the same time, we're a business that is still very much in a growth phase. So the new supermarkets coming on board uh, are more hesitant. You don't have a face to face talks with the new supermarkets. So that is on on uh, on hold. So we don't know where this is is leading yet, though. Wouldn't you as a supermarket want more chocolate if it's getting sold out? No, but I mean, in new supermarkets I'm talking about. So yeah. Your discussions with new supermarkets have been, no, because they are focused on their logistical chain at the moment. I can imagine they have bigger things to focus oh, on now than like putting that. new materials on their shelves. Um, so they are, they are focused on their log- logistic systems. They don't know where it's, this is leading to either. So everybody is slightly hesitant at the moment and, and not knowing where this is leading. So that normally means you're kind of in a lockdown and a standstill. And we see that happening. We completely appreciate and understand why that is happening. Um, at the same time, though, if you look at us as a company, it's 160 people that are all working from home. So that does have an impact. Uh, every and, single uh, one example, works from home? Nobody goes Every into... single one. And since every when? The since clo- the, the announcement offic- or before already? Since what are we wednesday 25th for one and a half weeks since since the friday one and a half weeks ago so almost two weeks ago and was that, for was that like a for shock example, I tend or to, did you guys have systems in place already like how was the step wow, towards that? No, well nobody nobody is prepared for a situation like this let's face it but we do have a system where we all work through for example microsoft teams so for us the infrastructure was already there to be able to work from home uh, we all have laptops, so we can all work from home anyhow. Um, but for me personally, in my job, for example, I tend to travel the world and be on stage at conferences, and they are all um, cancelled. So I'm doing Tony's talks online now in a live stream from my home, which is uh, completely different than what I uh, was used to. And this counts for many people. I mean, the people that are normally running our offices, the people running our stores, uh, things are, are changing uh, quickly. 
and so so it has a huge impact there and then you don't have <clears throat> i mean you don't have face-to-face -face, uh, physical uh, meetings and sit-downs what we now have is in the morning we have our online uh, meetings and huddles to see how everybody is doing we sent a um, current tony's uh, survival package uh, uh, as a bit of tongue-in-cheek last week to everybody within our team trying to keep the spirits up uh, we had a we did a pub quiz uh, from home, uh, trying to keep the spirits up. So it's it's really uh, making sure that everybody is okay. How are the huddle calls? Are I'm assuming it's not all 160 people. It's just teams, right? We have that. Oh, we've, had, we've had that twice now. Uh, a complete Tony's huddle. So we do that once a week at least, to really make sure that that we see um, uh, the leadership team, see what the heads and chiefs are about but also just make sure that everybody is okay and get a rundown from uh, everybody in the company. Every Monday morning, we always within the company have a Monday morning meeting anyhow. That is um, that is within the bigger team, so that is Holland, uh, but it, we have uh, UK and US calling in as well. Um, uh, we all, And every morning we have it within the teams and also within the specific teams. So for example, in the marketing team, which is the overall marketing team at 9 a.m. We have a online huddle and then at 930 we also have a huddle in the specific team. So that's design, that is movement, uh, and that is products, etc. So so how how do you think it has affected productivity or or did you did you introduce new technologies as well to maintain productivity? No, well, we have Microsoft Team, which is the technology that we have anyhow. But for example, uh, we quickly set up for me personally, we set up a live stream with OBS software that we sent through to our YouTube channel of Tony's, where people can log in and see online Tony's talks, for example, that is a that was a new technology for us. But having already we're already working with um, uh, Microsoft uh, 360 and Microsoft Teams meant that we were already uh, set up for uh, to work the way we work now so what is tony's talks then just you talking the whole day or different people talking <laughs> <laughs> well well my, my job in a sense is yes to present about where we come from as tony's where we're working towards our mission the way we work as a team the way we do marketing the way we do sales so that is that is what i would tend to do on stage anyhow uh, and those talks we have now turned on to online talks where I started off first for, well, grade school students because I wanted to help uh, uh, universities and high schools and grade schools because they were switching to uh, online and they were struggling with finding content for themselves in the beginning as well. So I just offered them, you know, you need content, let me know and I'll set up an online talk in Dutch, in English. Yeah. Uh, so that was that quickly became a, a huge success where we have yesterday we had an online talk with uh, 250 people from several universities and, and uh, universities of applied sciences logging in from Belgium and Holland. And I tried to answer all of the questions that they might have. Uh, and I also do uh, conference calls. I do a lot of these interviews and podcasts these days because, um, well, it, things don't stand still, but I think, uh, first of all, let's focus that we're all okay and that the team is still healthy and okay everywhere too. How does, uh, how did the company start treating, yeah, the coronavirus when it first um, happened? Is there a crisis team or were there significant changes in how employees were um, handled? I don't think I understand your question. So um, a lot of companies when the Corona crisis hit, even before um, any uh, measurements from the government, um, started yeah. establishing crisis teams, um, taking specific. Right, right, right. Well, we just we just decided slightly ahead of the curve to start working from home. So I think on the I don't know when the first uh press conference was in holland but i think the day before we already decided to close our stores for example start working from home and how then many stores really uh, do went. you guys have in the netherlands we have two stores we have one store in our office at the Westergas area in amsterdam and we have one store in the center of amsterdam the superstore in the burs van berlaag in amsterdam oh. and um so we closed those down to make sure that we uh, weren't part of the problem but more part of the solution and then I started working from home, from home like just about everybody uh, does. And we have um, our people and culture team is really focused on, uh, on on how the team is doing. But we also have the IT support 
that is constantly working with the, uh, the Microsoft Teams, how we can work. But again, we had these systems in place, so that wasn't so difficult for us. I mean, we, we all have laptops, so we can work from home anyhow. So, and then if we would um, look at like the smaller companies, um, we actually have a ton of startups that apply to our events that are entering certain markets like vegan food and uh, healthy food, gluten mm -hmm. free food, that type of thing. Uh, also, startups that um, replace meat, obviously, that's popular nowadays. So, you're saying a lot of negotiations are stopping with supermarkets, a lot of things are closing. What would you advise those type of starting companies that need to kind of figure things out now? Like a lot of people are saying, yeah, you have to innovate, innovate. But like, how would they be able to innovate? Yeah. And I think that's a struggle for everybody at the moment and definitely uh, starting startups and, and, and starting entrepreneurs. You know, on a bigger scheme of things, there's, there's a lot of hardship and obviously a lot of uh, people falling ill from Corona. At the same time, uh, you, you need to have a positive view on this too. I mean, what, what can we learn from this? How can we work together? I see a lot of people coming together. There's a lot of uh, social activities that you see happening, whether it's online or in neighborhoods. There's people delivering food to other people. I think this is also a moment that we can recalibrate the whole capitalist system that we're in. And hopefully um, the post-corona era will mean that we can actually use this to, to, to change for, for good. And from an entrepreneurial perspective and for these startups, I would say um, it, I'd, I'd, I'd rather have an optimist view and see how businesses can adapt to this and see what, it, what they can learn from it and see what they can do. To, to stay afloat. And I see loads of uh, lovely entrepreneurial uh, uh, things going around where, where people that had no delivery are all of a sudden setting up delivery when it comes to food. Uh, people with food trucks that are getting in touch with uh, people in neighborhoods where they could perhaps set up on a square in that neighborhood and deliver to the whole area, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously I, I don't want to downplay the, the the huge negative negative sides for many entrepreneurs but there's a lot of opportunities as well at the same time and this is this is entrepreneurship in its core i think how what do you think the future like the future is gonna look like after corona what what do you think I the changes I, I wish i knew but from your i wish i knew i just experience. i can only hope i mean there's a yeah but i think you know what there's a i think cap 20th century capitalism has evolved to a situation where a lot of entrepreneurs are slightly confused i think or gotten slightly confused of what their purpose in life and within society is and this is not about creating as much wealth uh, for themselves as they can possibly uh, get together and i think within three four five decades we have gone the wrong way i mean it's all been about growth 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 and i think hopefully 21st century capitalism is much more about uh, uh, empathy and love and sympathy and true meaning and purpose and much more human to human kind of business. And hopefully this moment will open our eyes that it's that is indeed it's not about B2B or B2C, but it's H2H, it's human to human. I think what you now see is that, yes, you need a system, you need a social system. It, it, this, this disease is striking everybody as hard and, and, and there's, no, there's no discrimination within this disease. And hopefully we can see that people get together much more. And, and this hopefully means a new system that we can work in. So then um, just out of interest um, from your experience, um, do you think the industry well, especially this industry, which is a little bit different than uh, than let's say my industry of events or video, or whatever. Um, the supermarkets are being sold out like every day; things are empty. Mm. Um, do you think that things will change going forward for them, or are they just going to be like, "No, we made a lot of money, so we don't have to change anything." So being very traditional. I uh, know. I, th I don't think it's up to me to judge supermarket at this moment in time. I think we should wait um, and give everybody benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't. I don't know what it's whether we should judge 
at this moment supermarkets profiting from them selling out i mean their role is to deliver uh food and goods to people that need it uh, and they have uh, and they are working very hard to replenish their shelves and their stocks to help people um, and you see also supermarkets actively trying to avoid the huge hoarding uh, that you that we've seen in the last two weeks in playful manners or in restrictive manners i mean i loved this sign by a danish supermarket i think that said um, the first product or the first two products have the regular price and the next product is 134 <laughs> euros I saw that. Uh, in a more playful way uh, making sure that people don't start hoarding and act more socially but even the hoarding part you need you see this this i think that's only a small part uh, of society i think the bigger part of society is really joining hands and helping each other and that's a more optimist and positive yeah. view i think I, uh, so let us not judge supermarket at this point in time. Let's wait till after the fact. Yeah, I definitely because I think there's I, a lot of them that are playing a social role in society. Right. Yeah, I definitely don't uh, didn't mean in the sense that um, they are profiting from it. Um, they are definitely working really hard. What I meant with is so a lot of uh, techno technological innovations happen when these crises happen, but usually in industries that are suffering. And in this case, that industry isn't going to suffer. Um, that much uh, for good reason because obviously we all need uh, our groceries um, and I hope they make a lot of money so that there could be even more groceries so that it doesn't get sold out but um, at the same time I'm thinking there could be so much innovation happening within those supermarkets um, yeah and uh, and somehow like for instance the reason I say that is one of the things that is happening now in the Netherlands is literally every single supermarket uh, cannot deliver because everything's sold out. Every single slot is sold out. So um, I'm assuming the logistical value chain of getting food or groceries from a supermarket to somebody's house can use quite a lot of innovation just like amazon is innovating their um groceries or you know uh logistical right things um but obviously right now everybody's super busy so that's not going to happen with those innovations as you mentioned because well they're all busy um but i can imagine from the perspective of tony's then um you guys have a little bit more time on your hands because one of your stores, um, you closed it and uh, the negotiations mm -hmm. are mellowing down. Are there specific innovations you're looking at to become more of an Amazon for chocolates or something like that? <laughs> we, we don't have the aspiration at all to become the Amazon of chocolate, honestly. Um, I wish perhaps Amazon would become the Tonys of the online ordering uh, platforms but um so no but what you i think i think we are at the moment uh business as usual uh, I, in a sense we are not looking at uh technological innovation as much as other companies tend to do i think we are much more looking at uh, social and societal innovation and how, how you can actually uh, innovate in the field of making a, a physical impact in the in value chain that is what we what we look at. So I would call that social innovation, which is the angle that we choose. What you do see, for example, now we 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 are uh, we have a we call them the Tonys Unlimited, which is a uh, machine that we have in one of our stores that produces uh, your personal a uh, bar of Tonys. So you can make more than twenty two thousand different combinations of. Uh, chocolate but also of packaging and you can put your own name on there and, and for example i think the team behind that is now working hard on 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 how can we make sure that those home deliveries get get brought to people but again we are in such early phase of this corona crisis that at the moment we are more looking at how can we actually support local initiatives with our chocolate how can we uh, uh put a uh a bit of a smile in the faces of people that are finding hardship at the moment and then after this let's see it how we need to have more business innovation maybe. wait so quick question you guys have a machine that can make any chocolates ever yes so okay uh, ever we have we have you have uh, three types of chocolate so you have white chocolate you have milk chocolate you have dark chocolate you can then choose uh but have a look at it uh, on the website as well 
Uh, you can then uh, choose what layer of chocolate you want uh, beneath and then you can choose three ingredients uh, and um, and create your own bar. And so a consumer can just buy this machine or not? No, no, no. We, the machine is a big investment. You don't buy the machine. You buy the bar that the machine makes. So have a look on our website and the Choco shop. You have, you have designed it yourself and then you have the Tony's Unlimited on the right side. And the Unlimited bars, you can design your own bar of chocolate, your own ingredients, your own wrapper, and then it's sent to your home. So, so why have you never thought about making it available, uh, like making a consumer version of that? I can imagine that would actually uh, create a new revenue Because source. I don't think... Because what do you mean with the consumer version so, of the machine? Yeah, of the machine, uh, something like for like 50. Because of where do you source your you uh, 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 people at home can't make their own chocolate, right? They can't buy their cocoa beans and turn that into chocolate. It's a, it's quite an uh, uh, it's quite a process to make your own chocolate. We'd rather make the bars for them because we're sure we can make the best chocolate for them. But don't you have those? Uh, I know that in big uh, warehouses you can buy like bags of chocolate and then you put them into a machine that melts it and then you have like your but have a look i don't think i don't think you understand what uh, i mean have okay. a look in our shocker shop and how the tony's unlimited works no worries i'll check it out this is not this is not about this is not about just making a mold and putting your chocolate in there and making your own bar it's really what kind of ingredients do you want in there what kind of wrapper do you want around uh, it okay. print your own wrapper etc makes sense um so i i have two more questions that that i really wanted to ask uh now that i have you on the call so uh when you got into the company i can imagine you either saw somebody who went to ghana or went there yourself or something that really made it all real for you do you have a story yes, like I that this is you can share I think this is this is also essential. I think once you've been there uh, on the farms and spoken to the farmers that that uh, grow the cocoa beans, that is really life changing. I think because that makes that makes that relationship with those farmers so real. So I I indeed I was in Ivory Coast. I haven't been uh, to our corporations in Ghana yet, but I've been to uh, cooperatives in uh, in Ivory Coast. And that is uh, that it is good to see what is happening on the ground. And it's also put things uh, in perspective. And, and we have people on the ground there constantly. We have an impact team at Tony's that is constantly in these building these relationships with these cooperatives. But many and I would say almost every Tony's has ever, always been to uh, our cooperatives in Ghana and Ivory Coast. Can you share a story that really changed it for you or made it real? Well, I was I was in in Ivory Coast. It's good to see the the. It's good to see, even just the the distances that you travel in a country like Ivory Coast, the condition of the roads. You see uh, that it's not as easy as things sound to just get cocoa beans from one place to the other, and then you see the cooperatives and you see the farms and you see the the situation that these people live in, and you shouldn't expect. Uh, lovely white cottages with flowers around it from the farmers that we work with. Uh, it, it is, uh, it is a, a lengthy process to, to really change that system and to really make sure that the poverty diminishes for everybody over there. So it's, um, it is a different level of uh, poverty that you see there than wh whatever I've seen in the rest of the world. Can you give an example? What, what did you see? And like, well, I, mean, I think so. If you, if you, if you take what I had seen uh, up till then in my life, uh, anywhere, whether it's in Asia or South America, what I had seen and where I had traveled, you always still have stores selling, for example, uh, Oreos and Pringles chips, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and what you see in Ivory Coast, once you leave Abidjan, uh, there is there is no brick and mortar buildings that you see anymore. Almost uh, these are huts uh, by the road, uh, motorcycle repair stores, uh, roads that are torn apart until the next election uh, moment again. Um, uh, dirt roads that when it has rained, it, it takes you a full day to travel 50 kilometers. Um, and these are farmers that grow cocoa beans on tiny plots of land uh, that have have very little means for themselves. 
So just increasing their their uh, their uh, revenue, helping them increase their uh, own productivity, is essential to get them to where we want them to get. It's it's a different level of poverty that you see over there. But so what what does Tonys do exactly? They just give them more money, or do you build roads, or do you go? To so we pay. The, f the first and most important thing is build this long-term and direct relationship with these farmers. So we buy these cocoa beans from them when you pay a higher price for the cocoa beans. On top of the fair trade premium that we, I mean, all our beans are fair trade, uh, uh, fair trade certified. So you pay about, a, at the moment, about a 20% fair trade premium to those farmers. But on top of that, we pay an additional Tony's premium that is if bridging the gap between that fair trade price and the market price and the living income reference price that we've set up with the fair trade organization that we think every uh, chocolate producer should be paying. So it's to show that we pay, we pay on average, I would say about a 50% premium on top of that market price that the farmer would normally get. We also help them increase their profit, uh, their, their, their productivity uh, by giving them uh, schooling, education, programs, awards for the best farmers to inspire them to increase their productivity, showing them different uh, farming techniques that they could use, helping them use inputs for their uh, farms, uh, but also, for example, a bit of the premium goes to empowering the, the uh, female uh, farmers there and the wives of the male farmers to start up their own businesses. Part of it goes to improving uh, um, uh, their health insurance or how do you call that the health situations yes. when we tell when we uh, tell a farmer listen you need to send your kids to school and they tell us you know but the nearest school is 30 kilometers down the road we help them build schools uh, locally we help them uh, build canteens in their schools etc etc but it's up to the cooperatives and the farmers what to do with the premium that we pay to them so they can just decide, I mean, this is an entrepreneurial relationship. They can decide what they want to do with that money. Part goes to the farmer uh, in cash, part goes uh, to the farmer in goods. So uh, materials that they can work with, inputs, fertilizer, uh, machetes, wellies, whatever they need. But so, and so what have you guys done so far then? Pract what do you uh, mean? Practical examples, Have you, how many schools have you built and... Do you have those I, I, numbers? Top of my head, I don't know. That you need to you need to look at our uh, our annual report that's on our website. That's that states all these things. What we do mostly, for example, is installing a system that we call our child labor monitoring and remediation system. That is now all the cooperatives and all the farmers they work with have those systems in place where you can see whether you run into incidents. There's in our in our annual report you can re read exactly on the amount of remediations that we've done. Uh, up to now. also on our website, by the way. Yeah, you can see what we've done very specifically on each uh, on each situation that we run into. You can see exactly the amount of uh, euros that we paid in premiums to our farmers uh, in the in the beginning of that valuation. Let me see whether I can have a quick read up. But I would just recommend you reading up on our website when you really want to dive into these uh, exact figures. I have it in front of me right now. Go for it. It's very nice as well, um, but. Um, I see here, so Tony's obviously has 18.8% achieved market share uh, and you bought 1,500 tons of cocoa. The The one that interests me here... No, we bought a lot more, we bought a lot more uh, tons. We've bought 1,500 tons open chain cocoa. That's, that's the platform that we've launched with uh, Albert Hein, for example, and where we invite other, uh, other companies to also join. Uh, I think last year we... Bought us personally, we bought five and a half thousand metric tons of beans. Um, we had uh, uh, in re well, this I, I would just recommend reading up uh, on, on our website. Great, and then, um, small question because we actually get a lot of uh, these companies that what do you think of companies that uh, they start as a startup and um they sell shoes or something a lot of these shoe companies mm -hmm. do that as well and then what they do is they donate um for every pair you buy you get you know a pair gets sent mm -hmm. to africa or something like that what do you think of those companies mm -hmm. or that business model specifically because a lot of startups are jumping on that wagon and i'm never sure if it's good or bad 
Me neither. And I don't think it's up to me to have a uh, opinion about this. I think, I think you need to always see uh, and keep reevaluating that business model specifically, because indeed there's good sides and bad sides to that business model. Um, I think you're referring to a, 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 a company that indeed uh, uh, donates a pair of shoes for every sh uh, pair of shoes that's sold in, uh, in Western society. You need to make sure that you don't take away business locally from the person that would be making shoes there, for example. I think that is what you're referring to. And I think you need to constantly, I don't, I, I don't think it's up to me to have an opinion whether that's good or bad. I think every business needs to constantly recalibrate that business model and make sure they don't do, uh, they, they don't uh, have negative impacts there because we might judge this company, but at the same time, there's also a Dutch lottery that uh, spreads uh, bicycles uh, to villages and then that bicycle guy in that village doesn't sell any bicycles for that year. So this is, we shouldn't judge uh, these startups, I think, that do that. I think we need to look at the positive impact that they're making as well at the same time. But let's make sure that any business any business model needs to be constantly, I think, reevaluated and then needs to be able to have the guts to pivot when they realize that there's a negative impact or undo the negative impact. So you suggest that if uh, that business model is in place, that they really need to look at the metrics of everything that is happening uh, on the ground and whether it's good or bad. Yes, and then... uh, you need to, exactly. And then be able to pivot. I mean, let's face it. Uh, Ten years ago, we thought biofuels were the solution. Uh, to fossil fuels and what you saw happening is that the first generation biofuels were made from corn and uh, that directly uh, bid into the food chain in south america for example uh, and then you need to recalibrate and see what is the best solution and for example we can now make biofuels out of algae we can make biofuels out of grass so it also leads to innovations and we should embrace those innovations but realize that we need to uh, we can only embrace those innovations if we start realizing and are open that we need to be able to pivot and 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 steer and and change our business models yeah i agree um so again almost last questions um so what interests me a lot is what you mentioned in the earlier uh, conversation about serious friends now we have also something called ambassadors um these are the people that without them we wouldn't have grown that much but mm -hmm. how do you get those ambassadors serious friends how do you and keep them engaged and how do you make sure that they are as effective as possible towards right. your goals right. well first and foremost this is still work in progress for us what we saw is that we wanted we we when was it because I, I saw you have fifty-five thousand serious friends in your uh, mission report no i think we're at thirty-five thousand at the moment um i think we're at thirty-five thousand at the moment top of my head oh it says here uh, because fifty-five I think thousand my... serious friends that's thirty-five thousand more than we currently have oh that's oh that's for that's next our goal year. That's so you're goal. looking at our goals for this yeah. year yeah exactly um and i think we started out with fifteen thousand this year or something or 20 and and we we are now at thirty-five thousand. Anyway, uh, long story short, we're still really working on what works best, but, but we, we, uh, what works best for them, what works, what works best for us. But for example, two years ago, we launched a petition in the Netherlands uh, the, called Wet Zorgplicht Kinderarbeit. So this has to do with uh, due diligence within your company to make sure that there's no uh, child labor in your, uh, in your value chain. And this was a law that was passed in Holland and we needed our serious friends to sign a petition to up the pressure on the government to make sure that they realize that there's consumers that want this. So that was what we did two years ago that inspired us to set up the serious friends program. Uh, and what we do, for example, you have this, this login that you have, you can then jo join up, but we're still seeing what works best for them. Now, for example, we launched a petition at tonyschocoloni.com slash petition where we want to get a million signatures in total to really up the pressure on governments of the US and also European Union states uh, to make sure that there's laws in place all around the world, right? Where we make sure that there's enough pressure on organizations all around the world to uh, make sure that there's no human rights violation in, in their value chain. But it's still work in process how we're actually doing this, 
the serious friends and what, what we can give back to them. Up to now, what we do is we keep them informed on these um, things that we're doing, but we also in, inform them on the fun stuff. Uh, so there's a bit of new newsletter info involved. There's also giving them the opportunity to come to our annual party uh, uh, before other people, etc., etc. But it's a constantly and dynamic uh, playing field. And how do you? First and foremost, it's people signing up. So yeah, how do you get them to sign up? Because there's obviously a lot of well, missions out there. Yeah, so it's it's uh, it, we speak about this on our wrappers. Uh, I ask, I have a QR code in my presentation where people sign up. Uh, it's when we do talks all around the world where we ask people to sign up. Uh, it's uh, we have a truck going around through the U.S. where people can sign up if we have any. Um, uh, events we ask people to sign up it's any trade shows that we are we ask people to sign up so it's everywhere we have these in our stores uh, both our stores we have this wall for serious friends where they can sign up as a serious friend etc okay so pretty much wherever possible qr code and uh and ask people yeah and i used to be i used to be adamantly against qr codes a couple of years ago i thought they were outdated and now i think they're very useful again for this one for this why part. did you change your mind nah, i thought qr codes at a certain point were everywhere and useless and now i can put them in a presentation and because uh smartphones now don't need an app anymore to directly from a QR code get to where you want them to. Uh, that's right. uh, you can just point your camera and you have a direct link to the QR code. That helps. So you pretty much have 35,000 serious friends just from word of mouth, technically, from speeches and, and your rappers. And right? we, have 70, we have 70 million euros in sales just from word of mouth. So what would you recommend um, like a business that wants to really grow and use word of mouth? Would you say do more speeches, apply for more awards? I would I, so I would first of all have, have a story that's authentic and real. So it's not about just telling the story. I mean, obviously for us, telling the story is essential and, and, and we hope to do it in a nice way. But if your story isn't right, then it's useless to tell that story anyhow. Think, How do you right? know the story is right? So if, well, then we have to go back to the very first moment we started speaking. I mean, we're, we're a business that's there to change things in, in the world, right? So if you have a very clear purpose and you have a very authentic purpose that actually means something for society and the planet around you, I think that is a story that's that's uh, great to spread, right? If you're if you're just making hand grenades and, and, and cluster bombs, I don't think your story is very fitting in society. Yeah, get that. So pretty much something that really contributes to the world that we can all agree on that is beneficial to the world. And I think as a uh, entrepreneurial activist, I would say any business from now on or maybe already and definitely in the future needs to have a purpose that has to do with creating a better world. Yeah. Okay, so then you have your story. What what do you think would be the next steps that you would recommend? Tell it. So speeches <laughs> it. at conferences or anywhere, anywhere. Tell it. I mean, we started out uh, on any stage we we would people would give us, we would tell our story, and anybody would tell our story. So everybody in Tony's, and I would say in every in a, in a, in a company that that wants to tell a story needs to be able to tell that story. Um, and that is by being fully transparent, by having a story that has no hidden features behind it. Um, and, uh, and then perhaps at a certain point, you could decide to have a, a guy like me, an evangelist running around the world, telling that story as a full time job uh, to um, to really be able to spread those values. But I would say grab any opportunity you have, uh, whether it's business or private, to tell that story. I think uh, some Tonys uh, might not be as fun to stand by at the bar because they will just constantly tell you about what, how the world of chocolate looks like. <laughs> and uh, okay, what and what would you say about in the early stages? Do you think, especially young CEOs are just starting, um, is it worth it to tell the story at the beginning or should they focus on actually building the business or how do you have the balance? Because I can imagine... I would focus on building a business that has a benefit to the society around them. That would be my focus. And once you have that business that actually adds something to the world and society around them, telling that story will become an automatic part of your being. 
and whether that's through paid media, right? I mean, we we do it without paid media, but you could still um, put in ads for the good of the world, right? I mean, there's no shame in using ads. We don't do it because we think our story needs a a longer time frame because we have a very complex story. But if you have a very simple story that adds uh, anything to the world, feel free to use uh, paid media if that's your way. For us, it's telling the story. And as a independent uh, advisor ages ago, when I was an in independent entrepreneur, I would also, uh, and I, afterwards, as, as a professor to students of, uh, of uh, new companies and of entrepreneurship, I would always tell them, go to any chamber of commerce meeting, go to any entrepreneurial platform, go to any conference or, or whatever you can find, just go there and soak up information, but also spread your story to people around you. If you have the time, go to anyone you can walk up to. Okay, and then uh, a, maybe a tip that you have, especially from your position, you get to speak a lot at conferences. How do these uh, young entrepreneurs then get uh, all these opportunities? Do you literally just email? No, by, 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 going, by going everywhere and starting to tell your story to two persons, then, then you get an audience of five, then you get a, get a living room audience of 10, then you get a classroom of 20, and at the end, perhaps you might be on stages with a thousand people around you. It's something you build up gradually. People need to see you, and people need to run into you, people need to be inspired by your story. And when your story is inspirational, people will be inspired, and they will ask you to tell that story at the next stage and the next stage. So how long in years did it take you to go from two people to like a lot of people? We went from two people to 160 people now in 15 No, I years. mean uh, uh, in stages, uh, as in you started... Ah, stages. Yeah, nah, that differs. That differs. It's not, about, it's not about just the amount of people that are in your audience, right? I mean, it's also uh, talking to the right people in an audience. And that, that's something you gradually build up. And some big stages come by on day one and some take ages. But it, you can't put a very specific timeline on so that. It's just your advice is not grabbing focused. every opportunity you have. Your advice is then not to focus specifically on big stages, but on industry specific Look at stages. quantity and quality. Okay. Uh, look at quantity and quality at the same time. I mean, you need to... It, it's no use talking to a thousand people that... that have no that don't care and that are, you are not interested in and they are not interested in you um, at the same time you could find 10 people that might become your biggest brand ambassadors and they might be the best audience you will have in your lifetime okay so yeah so pretty much quality and quantity needs to be balanced and then tell you yeah. make sure that your story actually helps people and then just tell your story everywhere exactly. and in in the exactly. meantime, just make sure that the foundation of your business is actually running and showing examples of that story. Exactly. Cool. No, I think that is actually really interesting. Um, do you have anything that you would like to add uh, specifically for social entrepreneurs or activist entrepreneurs, like you called them? Um. With the, with the danger that I might open up a, a, a new one hour of conversation, <laughs> I honestly, in the last couple, uh, well, last year or two years, have started to steer away from being called, or at least calling myself and, and also being called a social entrepreneur. Because that has the risk of uh, ending up in, in, or being seen as part of a niche and I honestly think that entrepreneurship as a whole needs to be recalibrated uh, and ha is or will be social in its core anyhow. So this is what I mean with new 21st century capitalism where entrepreneurship will be or already is much more social in its core and it's not something you add on to entrepreneurship. Um, so by realizing that uh, uh, then that puts you out of that that um, uh, thing that we talked about uh, earlier in this podcast was where entrepreneurship and doing good for the world would be two extremes of one spectrum, right? People often ask, how can you combine being sustainable with making money? I think the moment you let go of that being a paradox, then you realize it can be one and the same thing. And we're the living example that it can be. Right. Being financially successful, so doing good financially can go hand in hand 
completely with doing good for society around you. And once you start realizing that, I think, I think it's good to let go of the division between entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, but realizing that entrepreneurship is or will be social in its core. And then I think that is the entrepreneurs of the future that will be successful. And you can see it around you with companies like Patagonia, uh, Tony's Chocolonely, uh, Sapia, Doper, etc., etc. But don't you think... So my, my, my tip would be to let go of that paradox. And my second tip to starting entrepreneurs, in your case, would be to never think you're too small to make a difference. What do you mean with that? Well, I think anybody can make a difference, whether it's consumer level or it's an entrepreneur. Uh, if you think that you're never big enough, you I in, in my slides, I use one slide, one saying by Anita Roddick, the founder of The Body Shop, the lady who died way too young, unfortunately. She once said, if you think something small can't make a difference, try sharing your room with a mosquito. Right, And that shows how a very small thing can make a very big difference. And I think anybody, whether it's a consumer or an entrepreneur, can make a difference on any level, any decision you stand in front of. You can always decide, will I make the more sustainable, the more social decision, or will I have a different driver behind it than being social and sustainable? Why do you think um, the shift is happening towards uh, more social um because we, we because we landed in a complete overshoot of capitalism. What do you mean? Because that? I think twenty first century. Because I think there's the, there's more uh, wealth in the world, but it's not distributed as socially as it can be. And I'm I'm not I am not a social. I I'm I'm an entrepreneur in heart and soul, and I think anybody deserves a, uh, a the opportunity of thriving as an entrepreneur. But if you look at this. The division of wealth in the world sometimes it's, it it makes me nauseous and and very sad, right? If you look at the wealth at certain parts of the world and, and the utter poverty at other sides of the world where people don't have uh, cl clean drinking water, don't have uh, normal toilet facilities, can't go to school, and at the same time there's there's people living in ridiculous wealth. I think that is just the wrong signal, and I think people are starting to appreciate that. I think the you, the human side of of economy uh, has reached an overshoot in a couple of generations that we're now seeing an underflow of new uh, true leadership that has to do with empathy, uh, sympathy, and hopefully I would consider working it much more working towards a love economy where we much more have a human side to it. Do you think it's also regional specific? Because I... Uh luckily have been seeing the same thing that it's going more towards uh, an economy and capitalism where you really help each other which now with the coronavirus and everything is really mm -hmm. starting to show but do you think that some parts mm -hmm. in the world just don't like they pretend to care but don't care or the circumstances don't allow them to care um, and so they just accumulate wealth uh, without thinking Mm, yes and no. Uh, I think yes. I mean, if you if you really zoom out and look at the planet, you obviously see a uh, a higher level of wealth in uh, Western Europe and North America and certain parts of Asia, uh, and a lesser amount of wealth in Africa or Asia or South America. But at the same time, you also see the same kind of divisions. If you zoom in again, right, you also see that at, at in, in levels in, in Brazil or in Africa or in Western Europe, there's also poverty in Western Europe, which is unacceptable. I mean, there's kids going to school in the UK without breakfast. The, the only hot meal they have once a day is in school. I think that's ridiculous as well. So there's a lot of stuff to fix it. I, I, I don't think you could really mark it down on c certain regions that, that easily. That actually brings uh, me to a really interesting question that I always have um, when I'm dealing with, especially so when we started, there wasn't a lot of uh, social impact and entrepreneurship. So we decided to create this event where we would allow, uh, especially if uh, a, an entrepreneur had impact, a positive impact on someone, we would stimulate them and we would give yeah. them pretty much everything they needed to to become viable. Um, but what I also had, I had weird conversations with people who said, um, why do you focus on helping specific startups who don't help, you know, here locally, 
um but they help like people in africa or asia or Mm -hmm. latin america um Mm -hmm. and and my my answer was always well the whole mission for us was so that we can facilitate and help somebody who can at least help one human life um but you have these diverse reactions obviously we help startups that help locally but also we want to help startups that you know are international or are in africa or in latin america Mm -hmm. So how do you answer people how, when you're in that discussion? How do you answer people that say, oh, no, we have enough problems here? I guess the, the discussion is everywhere. For instance, Elon Musk, who's doing with SpaceX going to Mars and then everybody answering, we have enough problems here on Earth. Why are we going to Mars? Um, how? Yeah, but at the same time, yeah. you know, we can we can we can always criticize uh, everybody down to the ground. But I, I much more take a, a positive view there. Yes, you could criticize Elon Musk for uh, wanting to go to Mars. At the same time, this guy is, is putting his balls on the block constantly as an entrepreneur to make sure that within five years' time, we started driving electrical cars that were comfortable and had a long range, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, right? So uh, yes, you could criticize uh, social entrepreneurs that are doing, doing something for people on the other side of the world at the same time they are doing something for people period and yes we need people to do more for people locally as well but we need both and we shouldn't be criticizing everybody constantly that they're not doing what you want them to do uh if if they are doing something right for the world as a whole i mean t- we need to take a bigger perspective we are no longer uh, uh, I mean, we are no longer separate ships on the ocean. I mean, this whole world is intertwined and interconnected, right? And you see that with the sustainability discussion. Uh, CO2 emissions don't stick to your country. I mean, they go all over the world, and this is a global issue we need to uh, face. And, and that has the same thing with global poverty. It's a global issue that we need to fix, and yes, at local level as well. So so what? Have you been in those discussions? What do you tell people? Do you just say we're all interconnected? Yes, this is what I told you. I tell those people yeah. as well. And I, I salute I salute these uh, initiatives. And yes, we need to do it locally and we need to do it globally at the same time. Correct. It's all intertwined. It's all one big system. True, true. No, I like that. I like that. I think that's uh, actually a really good closing, a very positive note as well on uh, making sure especially during this crisis, to understand that things are local, but also international. Um, and we, wherever needed, need to help people. I'm, uh, I'm extremely excited that you guys are offering your chocolates also online. Uh, you're not promoting or anything, but I love your chocolates, obviously. So I'll be ordering some stuff online because everything's sold out. <laughs> <laughs> cool go for it cool um anything else you have to add if not then uh, then we're gonna close here let's close off i think we covered everything this is a long point yeah <laughs> thank you so much for coming by if anybody's interested in becoming a serious friend of tony's i'll uh, make sure that the links are below um perfect and uh yeah i'm gonna sign up as a as a serious friend for sure and uh, I'm super Perfect. excited. Sign our petition, become serious friend. I will. I'm super excited that you are here Perfect. with us. And um, yeah, thank you so much. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup funding event team.